Uh, good morning, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this panel on uh, decarbonizing India's power sector. Uh, on this panel with me are uh, Richard Rosso, uh, Senior Director, McNaughty Associates, Pranav Banagay, uh, CEO of Petronas Lubricant India, and David Narang, Managing Director, Syndicatum Sustainable Resource India. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the panel. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you people. Uh, so uh, let, let me begin this uh, discussion by you know, focusing on uh, the Indian discounts, right? Uh, we know that the state of the Indian discounts are, it's, it's, it, they are in a pretty bad shape. Uh, you know, despite so many uh, bailout packages, they continue to be bad. Uh, what do you think are the chief reasons for the continued financial distress, uh, distress of the discounts? If I may jump in, uh, Sri, just to take this question on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> we have, uh, as you are aware, India is divided in a number of states and every state government wants to be very popular. So this whole issue of giving free power to anybody, uh, in my opinion, doesn't work. And the second thing is that discoms are highly inefficient in India with a lot of and transmission losses. So unless we control these two issues, uh, which is distribution and transmission losses can be controlled by technology. Uh, it's not difficult. It's not rocket science. But giving, given, giving free power is a challenge. In fact, we had proposed to the government that you could give money to the farmers in their uh, under the Manrega scheme, which is very which is very popular in India, and let the farmers pay for the power. So this way, it's money going back from the government, coming back to the government, because most of the discoms are uh, held by state governments or central government. They're really not, all are not privatized. So these are challenges. And if this continues, we will be putting good money after bad year on year on year. I mean, I don't see a solution unless they are absolutely all are privatized and, um, you know, uh, the government stops interfering. Just to sort of pull that further, I think it's a combination of a policy plus technology play as well, uh, because there's almost 20 to 22 percent of losses of TND losses in India, I think is one of the highest. And that's where from a private sector perspective, it's, it's sort of an eye popping opportunity if there could be technologies coming in, smart grids, uh, and a whole slew of offerings that can come in to solve that angle of it. But definitely, I mean, and on the policy front, definitely agree with you. I think it will require a lot of work and will and intent to drive it. I think you saw the, uh, the Modi government um, really kind of accentuate that because of a lot of good intentions. I mean, just think about all the energy reforms that they announced in the first two years of its first term. Uh, the bailout program for the grids, the Uday program, the renewable energy program, the coal reforms that were triggered by courts revoking licenses, these dramatic oil and gas reforms, the new hydrocarbon exploration licensing policy, Sobagya, to deliver electric power to every village and every home. And a lot of times, you know, too, when you're trying to do the bailout and you're forcing states to buy more expensive renewable energy and you're forcing them to bring more customers on that are the, the most heavily subsidized, so all great intentions, uh, just tough to do all those things simultaneously and, you know, in some ways worsen the situation for a few states too. Right. Uh, uh, interesting that you, you spoke about putting money in the hands of the farmers to, uh, through the m and scheme. Uh, the question is, uh, does it give an opportunity for the discounts to raise the tariff, at least in the agricultural sector, because... Uh, the power consumption in the agriculture sector has been traditionally uh, cross-subsidized, right, and quite significantly. So putting the money back in the hands of the farmers, do you think that will uh, give an opportunity to raise the tariff uh, uh, the, in, the agriculture in the agriculture sector? But also taking this point a bit uh, broader, right, there's been a lot of praise for the uh, direct benefit transfer scheme of the government of India. And how do you see that impacting uh, not just the agriculture sector, but also the broader sectors in terms of the ability of the discounts to raise the tariff? Yeah, so, you know, Sri, I think uh, that's a very good question. 
let me tell you, it's just a, it's a debit and credit entry as far as the government is concerned. You know, the DISCOM loses money, as uh, Pranam and Richard have said. Somebody has to fund those losses. So those losses come from central government. I mean, uh, apart from $10 billion, which was announced uh, last year uh, during the lockdown, uh, this year they've announced, I think, $40 billion over a period of time. Uh, so if you have a direct benefit, benefit scheme or a transfer, it just balances the equation because the farmer is repaying the DISCOM and instead of the government paying the DISCOM. So money is just circulating. But it may work very well because it gives a psychological benefit to the farmer that, or to any individual that I'm getting money into my account. So politically, it, it would be the correct thing to do, in my opinion. And then that money goes off. Actually, government can use technology to say that, okay, so many units of power will be at X rates. If you exceed that, it will be X plus Y. So it, 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 it uh, you know, you've got to incentivize the farmer. Secondly, you've got to make sure there is no wastage. Uh, whenever anything is free, it's wasted. You know, so electricity is free. You don't mind if the fan is running. I mean, who cares? You're not paying for the power. But the moment you start paying for it, and you are either incentivized or penalized, it works, it works very well. Now, apart from the paying front, you, you, you interestingly mentioned about how to make it to the next level of smart pricing, because there was also a lot of conversations about, you know, peak of peak load, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you manage that? So I think that's also an intrinsic challenge that we're facing because you're continuously sort of using it uh, and then you're not able to, you know, optimize the loads as well. So mindset shift if you're able to get pricing to the people who have been using it for free i think that will be a bit big big mindset shift even if the money circulates but aided with a a, a, a intelligent intervention in terms of management software others you know that would probably make it more palatable for these guys and, uh, there's a, there's, a yeah. there's another model too which of course is you try to get farmers completely off the grid and, and that's where, you know, you see some small pilot projects that are being done across the country and things like, you know, can, can you get small farms to go fully solar? You know, Bangladesh has had a lot of success in, in, in really kind of promoting uh, off-grid solar. But, you know, you need ultra-efficient water pumps to be able to do that if you want to have farmers get, be able to do the, uh, the kind of basics that they need. But that's an alternative model, too, that states are trying to do. Um, there is a program to stimulate DBT right now. You know, the, uh, the Modi government a couple of years ago announced a set of citizen-centric reforms and states can breach their debt limits a little further if they undertake certain reforms and one of those was at least finding one pilot district uh that would that would shift to dbt for farmers um but uh, only two states have done it you know so uh once again i think we a lot of times kind of overestimate uh the big boss's power even to move bjp states to do things so it's andhra mm -hmm. pradesh which is obviously outside his remit and uh in madhya pradesh so uh so there is there is some nascent work there, but uh, even 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 the PM's own states aren't uh, aren't picking it up with relish. So uh, much to be done. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, also the point of optimizing the load and you know uh, incentivizing behavioral change with peak of peak pricing, right? Also, we haven't seen much of demand response programs uh, in India rolled out yet. Right. Uh, just last month, I think uh, Tata Power got into an agreement with this um, company in the U.S., Autogrid, and I think they're going to roll out the first uh, AI-based uh, demand response program. Right. So I think uh, I think the demand response programs will play a critical role in uh, optimizing the load, in, in, in uh, particularly in the residential sector. But I don't know how effective it's going to be in the agriculture sector. Any any thoughts on that? I don't know. It's 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 a it's a difficult question. Let's see how it rolls out in the residential sector, and uh, then how the connectivity in the whole the whole entire system works out in the agricultural sector. Yeah, I think I think I think it's still very early days yet. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a model in the agriculture sector that I think um, you know a few states too are trying to figure out, which is getting back to the point about you know solar based water pumping. And what's that going to do to the water tables if they have unfettered access 24 hours? A, well, not 24 hours, but at least during sun, during sunlight, um, to be able to draw water. 
uh, are they going to choose, you know, more water intense crops and kind of take that the other direction? Because, you know, it's also a very uh, water scarce country there. So finding ways to um, to incentivize farmers, maybe to sell some electricity or at least not to not to drink groundwater. So uh, interesting uh, pilot models are being done there as well to try to find that right balance where you get them off the grid. They're self-sufficient, but they're not going to, you know, destroy the water tables any further because, um, uh, you know, every step you take, there's a there's some type of repercussion. Yep. Yep. Uh, also, you know, uh, when, when, you, when you talk about the financial uh, uh, distress of discoms and India has a pretty ambitious renewable energy project, right? I mean, they have a goal of 450 or uh, five, I think 450 gigawatt by 2030 or 2035, something like that, which is about more than 50 percent of the plant capacity. But uh, how does the, you know, how's this? crippled state of discoms, how is it impacting uh, the risk appetite of the re- renewable energy generators in India and their financial backers? Yes, that's really very interesting, actually. You know, what's happening is, three is that if you see the past five years or seven years of renewable energy sector in India, especially solar and wind, so A started, A exited, B came in, B exited, C is coming. So you've seen a of, of course, some players have stayed on, like Renew and some other larger mm-hmm. players, Tata's Renew, uh, Adani. So you've, but you've seen a shift of the smaller people exiting, and the market is aggregating. So mm-hmm. even if the discom is in trouble, people are willing to take that risk. Of uh, so, remember, Indian discoms delay; they don't default. They delay payments, but they don't default. Ultimately. There is some rescue package you get. So people have now started building that in their return projections. That is one. Secondly, going forward, it's simply a, a question of the return you want on your capital employed. So somebody may want a 12% dollar return. Somebody may work at 7%. Somebody may even work at low than 7%. Now, it depends if EAC funds are coming in or you want a uh, a sort of a year-on-year return, like an uh, invit. So this these de- determine the investment criteria. But I would say that 450 gig- gigawatts, if the present policies continue and a bit of more uh, and demand is rightly created, is not a challenge for India. Land is a challenge in India, mm-hmm. but later storage technologies will come in uh, in definitely in the next five to seven years, which will make power very affordable. Uh, right. to the citizens. Uh, I right. ec- also want to echo what, what you were saying there because I think this decade can be the one you, where you can actually pivot in the right direction because there is a, a natural demand. I mean, you want to increase almost double, two and a half times the power consumption. At the same time, the, the timing is right. I think COVID sort of gave that impetus to to look at alternatives because the coal were struggling for the last two years. And the technology seems to have reached to a point where um, it can be sort of, you know, deployed in a larger scale. So it's not only constant. I mean, the technology is ubiquitous. Uh, yes, there are larger play- players like what Devin mentioned, Renew and others. But could would be a very interesting decade to play out. And if they get it right in terms of the policy, the, the technology, getting the players there, giving them the runway to develop, you could end up looking at a very different 2030. At the flip side also, there is a challenge that if you don't get it right, you'll probably keep on pumping coal. And, uh, you know, you would still make, like I said, you know, the, 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 the cities would be clean, but the, the, the air will be dirty somewhere else. So it, it's a, it will be an interesting decade to watch out. Yeah, 20, 28 different stories on this, too. You know, you've got some states like uh, Karnataka and Gujarat that are doing pretty well in meeting the uh, the targets that are set out there. And, you know, not surprisingly, those tend to be the ones that uh, have relatively high rated uh, distribution companies and, and pretty close to break even. And in fact, you know, Gujarat's four utilities are u- most years a little bit above the uh, break even point in terms of uh, cost recovery. So um, but then you got the laggards, you know, um, you talk about Bihar, you talk about Uttar Pradesh. Um, some of the big states. And and when you talk about the hole in India meeting, the 175 that's due next year and the 450 that's due a few years later, you know, it's going to be the big states. And there still aren't enough signs that those big states are getting things right. Um, 
I know, you know, having spent a lot of time in Bihar, you know, meeting with the energy folks there, you know, they're hoping that there's this uh, falling out that's happening because they suffered as a lot of states do from spurious bidders. Folks had put in a tender and said, you know, we can buy land at this, we can buy equipment at this. And of course they never could. And reasonable bidders uh, didn't go to those states anymore because there was a lot of these spurious bids they were losing. You know, you pull the, t the tender together, you can't win it. But uh, at least if some of the, uh, some of the less serious players um, stop clouding the market a little bit in some of these big states, um, that, that would be pretty helpful too. So uh, uh, I, I hope spring's eternal. Uh, but the big states are having a tougher time, I think, uh, getting their act together. To bring another perspective uh, to this uh, discussion. Now, you know, what I personally feel is that the, this whole game is going to change with storage. Mm. Now, yeah. uh, the, the whole, if you, so if storage becomes affordable for, for Indians, Okay, forget what the West wants to pay because we cannot simply pay what the West wants to pay. So if storage becomes affordable in the next five to seven years or eight years, I actually see that there would be large areas which has a good solar and wind potential or renewable energy potential. Uh, storage taking place in batteries which may be as small as this, I don't know, because we started with a very large computer and now everything is on your cell phone, computing is on your cell phone or on your watch for, for that matter. Now, if that happens, then in my opinion, transmission may be history because you may have centers of storage where ba the battery comes to your home like Tesla may do or EVs may do and that may power your home mm -hmm. and your devices and it's just a question of logistics and the person who can reach charge the battery uh, cheapest and this will change become a game changer and this will propel the economy because where energy is the most important thing to propel and increase the GDP for an economy you cannot simply function if there is no electricity and India has shown and Africa has shown that whichever village gets electrified the GDP of that particular village goes up People start doing small things, making pickles or making something or the other. So if, if this happens, this is going to be the game change. And this will lead to uh, uh, the base load part based on coal going away. Because without mm -hmm. base load part, you cannot have intermittent source of power. So, if, so this is going to be a game changer. And, th and this will propel because I do see that seven years from now, EV is going to become huge. Yeah. Uh, and if that becomes huge, both for two wheelers and for uh, cars and for public transport, the demand for electricity is going to be there. That's going to be buoyant. And we can forget 450 gigawatts. We may even look at much more uh, considering the size of the population. Uh, in, uh, interesting that you, you should uh, mention about EUVs becoming huge uh, in, in five to seven years. I remember in, uh, the government had a very ambitious target for uh, a lot of uh, you know EV vehicles, and then they backtracked. But also, the, when when you talk about the EVs, there's this issue of also the, how much of renewable en energy penetration is going to happen in the next five to seven years. Because if the grid is still predominantly going to run on coal, right, then how is EV going to scale up? Right, that's uh, and yeah, and even if it's going to scale up, what are going to be the uh, environmental implications of uh, uh, such a scale up. So I think these are the things to uh, consider, right? So, I mean, yes, I mean, EV has to scale up in my view, probably it will, but it also has to be in sync with the policies for renewable energy penetration in India. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think if it doesn't go hand in hand, it'll have a sort of a reverse impact on the climate that Exactly. That we say, and you call it greenwashing, you call it whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, but going back to Devin's point on, you know, definitely on the storage, bit, I think we are seeing different technologies coming in. I mean, it may not be only batteries. There is green hydrogen, which has been touted around as a, mm -hmm. could be a, could be a sort of a savior in terms of uh, reduces the dependency on, on rare materials or rare earths. Uh, there is also mechanical storage, which is which is also driving a, a different discussion at the moment, and particularly in hydrogen as well. I think you know a lot of the Nitya Aayog's push. A lot of the states are actually starting to look at 
hydrogen ecosystem as a as a as a next push factor or a frontier uh, sure. for getting the range of investments as well. So, would be interesting how how that storage game plays out. Yeah, and I think the whole aspect of uh, hydrogen and storage is also kind of there's a linkage between the two. I mean, as we know that uh, there was this uh, recent U.S. Uh, DOE India task force on green hydrogen, right? And you spoke about you know how the hydrogen market is going to uh, impact the storage, right? But typically, the applications of green hydrogen is going to be more for the long haul, right? I mean, he- heavy duty applications and uh, long distance travel, uh, more for long duration storage. Uh, so, and then India has a very very ambitious. Uh, uh, program for scaling up green hydrogen, but what what policies do you see uh, playing into that? I mean, what, what do you think will be the critical policies to scale up green hydrogen in India? Uh, you know, uh, Sri. First of all, first important thing is that if uh, the world wants a cleaner planet, there has to be tr- transfer of technology at very reasonable pricing. Mm -hmm. Uh, You cannot, for example, give technology to Africa at a price which Africa cannot afford and therefore their citizens suffer or for that matter, uh, you know, people in India or the rest of Asia suffer. So first thing is that uh, green hydrogen technology uh, must must travel very easily. Uh, you know what Google is doing. Uh, I think it's your namesake. It's an Indian scientist who's developed a technology for green uh, hydrogen, uh, which is going to uh, has gone live and is under experiment. Um, but you know things like this. Uh, government, of course, uh, is encouraging green hydrogen. We've got a green hydrogen mission now, uh, which is yeah. in. Yeah, uh, which is uh, got got it. Also, they are really encouraging, and private sector is actually moving forward. Uh, and uh, even the corporate sector is yeah, yeah, yeah. the CNI plants for green hydrogen. IOCL just announced like it was a t- one day or two right. days ago with the new CEO coming in. I think he's it's already trying to pivot. So, uh, uh, taking a step back, I think. Uh, Richard, uh, you spoke about uh, you know different states. Obviously, you know uh, electricity is a state subject, and you know, a lot of recommendations have been made for different states. And for example, Maharashtra, you need more of solar irrigation pumps and stuff. But given that it's a state subject, how what, what do you feel about the national pool market? The move to national pool market will will that help? Yeah, you know, it can, Um, you know, sometimes you've got, um, you know, lower cost that's in one state that you bring to the other, you know, up in North India, you know, you've got fast moving rivers coming off the Himalayas and the ability to evacuate that electricity to other parts of the country, you know, there's natural complementarities, you know, take that. In fact, you know, look a little bit further, you know, look at Nepal, you know, 83,000 megawatts of easily retrievable hydropower that has not been even remotely tapped into and, uh, you know the United, uh, the U.S. government actually, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is now working with Nepal to try to set up uh, so that they can begin evacuating more of that uh, into India. But um, you know, pricing remains a challenge, and so some of the ideas on on, on cross state swaps and stuff that have uh, been been attempted in the past, um, it, it can be tricky sometimes because you know states not honoring its contract, um, and and suddenly you add the cost onto it and complexity about moving it between different hands, uh, and it hasn't always been quite so smooth, but Huge promise there. Um, you know, again, you've got areas where you've got electric power that's not being dispatched. You've got, um, you know, that could be developed, like the northern hydropower. So uh, I'm excited about prospects. Uh, early indications haven't been quite so so- solid yet, but uh, great potential there. Great. Uh, also, uh, you know, speaking of schemes, uh, you know, there have been various schemes, and for example, the most recent scheme is the uh, reforms-linked uh, result-based scheme for distribution. Uh, and there has been criticism in the past that you know the situation of discounts will really not improve until the distribution segment is really addressed. Right. So, uh, 
how far do you think this uh, this scheme will go in meeting its objective and more importantly there have been other schemes in the past for example there have been schemes like oday in the past right and they have uh they have been probably and not an unqual- uh, unqualified fra- failure but they have been a relative failure so what do you think are the key lessons from schemes like oday and how can they be applied to uh, schemes like uh, uh the reforms linked to a result based scheme for distribution you see oday scheme was uh, you know the government is announcing schemes with all good intent but they have to be implemented with the same intent so problem is that uh, you know you have a scheme and then the implementation goes uh, haywire you you can have a scheme but suddenly some state government will uh, get up and announce that there's free power so what do you do with this scheme or any other scheme you want to do so i think uh, uh, my 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 end take in this is that i think it's time that india privatizes all discoms right know? yeah and government realizes value by valuing that discoms uh, and generating cash out of you know disposing of the uh, discoms and putting the cash into the state government's coffers so they can use that cash for other welfare schemes which they want to but i don't think the government should now be in the business of distributing power uh and they should just privatize all discoms which they are slowly doing throughout the country yeah i think back to the you know the electricity act amendments in 2003 the advanced power reform development program uh late in upa2 uh they they try to bail out program as well but i i i look at it like uh quitting smoking um you know at some point uh a few of these reforms have got to stick and you know the the latest program um you know there's going to be some impetus for for states to um to offer franchising again and that's been pretty successful Rajasthan has done a bit you know Torrent and CESC and a few others are doing pretty well in India so uh hopefully a few more states will pick on that it's not going to be a sweeping nationwide but yet but I do agree that privatizing statewide you know um is the most logical um there's 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 going to be uh, money laid out for uh feeder separation which is really the miracle that modi performed as chief minister of gujarat and that's why the four gujarat utilities are the four highest ranked in the country because when they do load shedding they know who they're hitting they got custom they they understand exactly what they're doing in in gujarat among the four um smart meters you know and have a better idea about who tamper proof so you know look uh, i don't think uh, you know every corner of india is is going to be improved but once again you know a lot of money thrown at it and there will be some small improvements in a few key areas so uh but you know you got the other big thing pending the electricity act amendments which you know go a little bit of the direction um you know that uh that devin was talking about where uh at least the central government for the first time ever will have more influence in tariff setting of states so not quite privatizing but at least um at least you'll have somebody at the table who isn't appointed by the chief minister and kind of bound by the boss's uh, political desires so small steps but uh the electricity act amendments too if they get through parliament um will get you a little bit further sure i mean uh, talking about the electricity act uh, many years back I, when i was working for cii cii that was when a lot of the d- debate of, around electricity act 2003 was going on and we made a lot of recommendations and still many of the recommendations haven't been implemented yet right so it's it's a, it's a, it's a slow process <laughs> Yeah. but also you know uh it's it's interesting because uh you know you have this financial dis- uh, distress of discoms which is traditionally you know fossil fuel based but they also need the renewable energy penetration to happen for for their situation to improve right so i i see uh two two challenges and both are kind of uh, disconnected challenges so one is when you talk about uh solar energy right i mean there 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 are talks about increasing the solar uh, manufacturing capacity the domestic ma- manufacturing capacity in india and stuff uh not sure whether that's going to be sufficient to meet the target for solar energy in india and india is going to be still very very reliant on imports for the raw materials for solar you know the the solar modules and stuff and that's where the geopolitics comes in right so how does how does india balance the whole uh issue about the long you know long term having a long term sustainable solar policy uh without upsetting either china or us 
so if you want my take on this so government announced this uh, <clears throat> pl pli scheme as well the manufacturing scheme uh, 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 recently uh, the, i think there going to be two three game changers so you have companies like uh, us company like first solar setting up a full plant uh, reliance has announced a big big program and when reliance announces something you know they will we know what they've done to the telecom market in india so mm-hmm. i think it's going to happen you're going to have you're going to have import duties which are going to come in which is going to make it more expensive for modules to come in from china uh, which has the largest capacity in the world today uh, we are seeing the same thing in the us also us has just announced that all the chinese companies using child labor we are not going to import from them the modules that is uh, uh, as if uh, it's about as recent as about a week so you we are going to have all these things uh, which are going to come in and yes there is a mismatch in our ambitious program the program india has vis-a-vis the availability of modules locally but i think we will overcome this as entrepreneurs see the benefit of manufacturing in india with the i mean that's what government should incentivize and probably they will a uh, lot of state governments will come forward and incentivize manufacturing in that stage which actually leads to more employment etc etc so i think it's going to happen it may be a slow process but i think we are in the right direction i think just a couple of points on that also right? if you realize just announced the electro electrolysis plant coming right. in which is basically right. the the key technology for hydrogen yeah but having said that there was an interesting thought around this devin and richard as well is that if you look at ev as a space you definitely see a very dominant china because a lot of the components plus the raw materials the the semi finished goods which are required for manufacturing of the technologies it's is largely driven by china i mean almost like has 101 uh, fact out of the 103 plants 130 plants all across the world 100 are in china so in this space when you see a if you look at it just sort of broad base it and you see that the early 1900s was all about oil and you had two or three power centers that came out of it which is the opec and others are there is already already a thought that if you pivot on a ev or a clean tech are we again pivoting towards a, a stronger china because and that's 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 where there could be some sort of a the cautiousness that might creep in into you know some of these pushes uh from a from a policy perspective but i think it is important like you said it is important to get the supply side right it is important right. to get the the entrepreneurs here it is important to get the uh investments to get the technology set out locally in order to go to that goal otherwise you'll again get into this sort of a bog jam in terms of whether you want to go there and then you have a policy uh, element that needs to be addressed uh, it's like a ge- geopolitical policy element that needs to be addressed so that interesting is, uh, times I, I, all i can say is very very interesting for for us to watch but you guys to sort of solve <laughs> some of it <laughs> that, that that's going to collide in washington in a big way and and i think you're going to see uh, as you saw in the obama administration uh, a big increase in tensions i mean you've got a a central government in Delhi that that wants to do the right thing climate change you know renewable energy electric vehicles but uh, for instance like right now one of the things that I'm doing is running a a a private conversation series with ex chief ministers in India and the largest US climate philanthropists to try to find out like what kind of things in climate philanthropy put money into that would achieve political scale that chief ministers would look at and say this is good i want to double down on that and i tell you what every single ex chief minister that we speak to on this says voters in india do not care about climate change and they don't care about mm-hmm. the air and they yeah. don't care about all that stuff but they do care about manufacturing jobs and so when you look at uh, you know I'm working with a number of state governments on electric vehicle policies uh you look at the renewable policies we've talked about for washington has to come to grips with this if we want india to make a major contribution combating climate change then allowing india more space for these local manufacturing policies has got to be squared in Washington and it's not right now. Right. So once again I think just like in the Obama administration 
You're going to have half the U.S. government showing up and saying, great work, we love the targets, it's terrific, and half showing up and saying, we're suing you with the WTO for your latest yeah. program. So I, I hope we can come to grips and square that circle because Washington, unfortunately, I think is going to be putting two different types of squeezes on Delhi. And, uh, you know, you'd love for it all to work out. But, uh, you know, I, I, right now, I, I think we're headed towards a period of tension on that, which is too bad because I think when Biden was elected, we all kind of thought that climate change and renewable energy would be one of the uh, real strong underpinnings of the relationship. But when you get into the details, <laughs> there's a little more friction than people expected. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, and uh, bef before we turn it over to the audience for question and answers, uh, the other uh, other angle which I wanted to talk about is also you know we talk about uh, and this is connected to the connected to the discounts financial situation. Uh, we talk about energy storage being a game changer in India, but we still don't have an energy storage target, right? And also, uh, there is a huge potential for uh, the hybrid projects in India uh, to, you know, scale up, you know, solar and storage or wind and storage or solar, wind and storage. But so far, that has been guarded, op you know, uh, optimism, so to say, towards these hybrid projects in India. So how do you see the lack of uh, regulatory standards or policy standards for storage? Uh, inhibiting the growth of uh, not just storage, but also the larger hybrid projects. And uh, do you see that changing in the next few years? Do you see the government having a more proactive, uh, more committed energy storage standard? Yeah, I think it's happening as we speak. Niti Aayog, which is the sort of uh, planning commission uh, in the new avatar, is actually working on it. I think uh, this COVID pandemic just delayed things. It's in the process. I think this 18 months has delayed some decision making, rightly so, because lives more, were more important than, and some policy decisions had to be kept pending. But I think uh, I'm quite positive that the next one or two years, because the government does, this government certainly consults industry and it's, it's, it's a joint effort. Uh, it's not a unilateral decision. So I think this will happen. It's happening. We will see it in the next six to eight months. Uh, state governments um, have a really tough time dealing with uh, fast move with sectors that have fast moving technology innovation because there's a lot of danger. You know, when you when you do massive procurements, multi -built, well, I should say, you know, tens of millions of dollars procurements. Did you make the right decision or does something come out two weeks later or somebody's going to call you back and say, why did you make that decision? Something better was coming. So, you know, there's also, I think, uh, much better space too for you know, technical collaborations with state governments in India, um, bringing in experts that understand the difference between, you know, I with a number of state governments like West Bengal. West Bengal has pump storage. They had money set aside for years that they would hand back to the coffers every year because they, they, they were uncomfortable making that big decision on where to spend the money at. Do they go with pump storage again or, you know, batteries and so many other things that are out there. So, you know, setting up standards and stuff is great, but also sometimes just simply getting a reliable person a state government can sit down with to give them advice, practical advice. This is the best thing for your need. If you've got high temperature, batteries may not be the best thing. Maybe that, you know, there's there's so many micro differences there. So, you know, it's one thing to set up standards and another thing, too, to try to give a little bit of direction because state government, state utilities, they don't have a big research team. And uh, a lot of people that come in, you know, or the, the private companies are looking to get a sale and they need an independent third party to, to kind of validate one direction or the other. So sometimes the solutions can be kind of easy. No, I completely agree with Richard. I think I, I am. I am, my concern is really about the technology is changing so fast and so quickly, and there is an array of choices to solve your problem. You're going to get into this kind of a conundrum as to what to choose, and the worst effect of that would be that you not move. You'll mm -hmm. be just in a same place. Okay, let's wait for the next best bus to arrive, and whether that collaboration, Devin, I mean, you're probably there closer to the to the seat. Is that, I mean, is there that level of collaboration? I mean, you're almost talking about like a PE, VC kind of a space here. And whether that's there or not, or whether it's these sort of not so relevant people trying to, you know, give those decisions or not, I think that, that will be very, very critical. And I, I, mean, I mean, if you have any... If you if you know how these guys are now actually 
getting the collaboration right would be great to share some thoughts. But one thing we've been doing is uh, actually connecting U.S. states and Indian states together. You know, there's there's nobody that you kind of trust better than a peer that has similar levels of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And these conversations are terrific. Um, I, I just kind of press go and I get out of the way. And, uh, you know, Telangana and, uh, and, uh, and California and Karnataka did California and Gujarat and Colorado. Uh, it's pretty neat. You know, I mean, there's just a comfort level when they're talking to somebody that has the same kind of responsibility. And, you know, usually U.S. states do have a little bit larger research, not to say they're perfect, but... Um, and, and so these these kind of technical collaborations between peer state governments sometimes is kind of the sweet spot. Fantastic! This has been a fascinating discussion, gentlemen. Uh, I think we have a few que- a few minutes for a couple of questions. So if there are questions, please uh, type it in the chat box. There are a couple, I think, in the chat, chat box. There are some comments. Uh, what do you think the best for India, nuclear or renewable energy? Uh, I think Chirag Mehta has asked a question. Uh, Raghav wants the mic, I think. I don't yeah. know. Up to Mr. Maurer. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just gave them. Uh, Raghav? Yeah. I, I'm based out of India, and we have a partnership in Switzerland. And uh, what we are seeing are a lot of emulates that have worked in Europe. We apply to the environment. You know, we had this company in London, in Sweden, which is into smart metering. And you know, just to get the collaboration in place in India, the regulation was so long that the bidding process itself took more than 12 months. <clears throat> we lost that opportunity. So, how do you actually work around this and make sure the right technology comes at the relevant time to the Indian market? Uh, yeah, Raghav, that's a very good question, and I really don't have a, a very good answer for that. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, I'll be very bluntly honest. It really depends upon how you can connect with the power center and uh, how you can lobby uh, and how, uh, you know, what influence you can use. Uh, you know, so that's what I would say that if you focus on that, and the concept, and if you're able to hit the, for example, one of, I would consider one of the best ministers, Piyush Goel, because if he likes the idea, he will uh, make it his passion to go all out and achieve it, like he did with LED bulbs. So that's my take on it. Pranav, I don't know. Richard, what you want to say? Your advice. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. I think you have, you've probably seen this play out time and again. <laughs> no, I, uh, nothing more to add. I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I know there's there's some small steps that are underway right now. Um, you know, they have the new uh, Mission Karma Yogi, the I Got system, where they're trying to improve training for bureaucrats at all levels. And you know, from my own conversations with you know uh, with the founder, um, the, the one of the first things they want to try to do is teach bureaucrats how to run um, uh, tenders more effectively. You know, standardized documents, maybe that's something, too, that Niti can pick up is offering a standardized document from state to state. But, you know, just, just give bureaucrats the tools to be able to uh, to run these things more effectively. So I think if, if Niti came up with a with a model and the training for bureaucrats was, was improved somewhat, um, that's probably the, the quickest way maybe to get there, to things move a little bit quicker and, you know, maybe some good things happening in both. Just to share a positive light here, Raghav, I think, I mean, when when we represent our organization, um, I saw a couple of initiatives. I saw Invest India, uh, which is which they're working with BCG, uh, with the center, and they are basically. I mean, I was impressed to, to see the BCG coming in and actually uh, driving this process of driving uh, to bring, bring the investments, have the right conversations, really apply some thought frameworks in what is relevant, what is not. Uh, also, I saw that uh, there were a lot of interactions which I had with government of Karnataka. Again, they, they're pretty much very well equipped on what questions they should ask, uh, what are the challenges that would come from a private sector in order to start something new. So I see I see change. I mean, it's, it's really good quality of question, good quality of interactions. And it just needs to catch stream. I think it will take some time, but we can, we can always keep our hopes high. Uh, there are just a couple of questions. One is, uh, what do you think is the best bet for India 
nuclear or, re or renewable. And uh, the other question is your views on the new PLI scheme for battery storage. I think the PLI scheme we dis we debated, right? Sri, I think we discussed that PLI scheme that it would eventually happen. Uh, whether it's nuclear or renewables, look, I have no issue personally with nuclear. We need base load power. There's another area which we didn't discuss in this group is bioenergy, which is again a potential of 20,000 megawatts of uh, agri waste which can be used to produce electricity. Uh, and that is also renewable energy power and that gives you base load power. Uh, so there, there, there are lots of things which India can do. As Richard said, it ha also has to be state specific. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, for example, wind is not going to work in Uttar Pradesh. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and solar is not going to work in uh, uh, Northeast where, you know, you don't have the radiance level or in other states. But bioenergy may work. So the state government has to actually, both in terms of nuclear and sorry, I'll, I'll pause here. Uh, I have no issue with either nuclear or renewable energy. Yeah, I, I mean, I think renewable hits all the positives that you wanted from nuclear and the price is going to be a lot better uh, without the risk of catastrophic failure. And it can also be a lot more decentralized. Which means, you know, communities won't be, you know, the next time that uh, a mean neighbor to your northeast uh, presses a button to cripple a grid. Uh, you know, more of a chance of survivability for local too than than big centralized nuclear power. So I, I don't think nuclear uh, today and in the future is just going to be competitive on on price or safety and security and such. So I think maybe its day is uh, maybe its day is done. Uh, I think we have a lapse of time, but I just have one question for my own curiosity. Why is it that the SECI uh, is having problem signing power sales agreements for the developers? Why is it a challenge for them? Uh, see, you know, what's happening in India is that you have the uh, solar tenders coming at the pace of a Lamborghini and the other infrastructure is still in an ambassador car. So what's really happening is that's the best example. So, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge is <clears throat> that a lot of, you know, with all good intentions, Seki will do a tender and then you got to stop. You can't sign because suddenly you realize that the other infrastructure is not in place. So if you have an entrepreneur who will take 100 megawatts and develop, the, and we've had these challenges in India, you have a plan ready, but there is no transmission available. There is no connectivity available. So you, so what does SECI do? So either you sue SECI uh, <clears throat> or then the government gets in. So what, I think what the government is now trying to do is to synchronize all its arms so that everybody runs or, or drives a Lamborghini because setting a transmission as Richard would know and Pranav would know, power, I mean, it, it's a two year process. It's a two, two and a half year process. And you can set up a plant in six months if you have all the permissions. So I think that's, and there are a number of other reasons because newer policies are coming out. So Seki just um, went slow and went back because they have to have back-to-back -back agreement with state governments for buying off the electricity and the state government backs out, then Seki backs out. So, you know, there are lots of these <laughs> issues which come in behind right. this, which, which are not really visible. Uh, great. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Richard, Pranav, and Devin. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, it was great talking to you guys. Great. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Have thank a nice week. Yes. And I think we we'll should get some sleep because it must be 2 3 in the morning for you. Thank you so much for moderating <laughs> and Richard being staying awake. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. in person next year. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.